And uh, I said, yeah, 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 I'll email them to you, he said. <clears throat> so I'm looking for the email, can't find the email. Uh, so I started putting together my thoughts on, on this topic, looking through the booklet as he has it, and uh, getting all my stuff together. And then about, I don't know, I don't know, it was a Wednesday or Friday, I don't know, I was going through an old email address of mine and found Steve's notes. So now I have two sermons to preach to you, the one he wrote and the one I wrote. I'll try to do my best to consolidate them. I'll talk fast, yeah. <clears throat> uh, two weeks ago, I was not here. Two weeks ago, I was at my home church where I grew up, where I was baptized, made my profession of faith, got married, uh, served in the youth group. That church is now closing. Uh, everybody sort of moved out of there, and uh, they invited us all back to come and worship and share thoughts and memories of, of the influence that this church has had on our life. Well, that was two weeks ago. While I was gone, uh, my partner Steve arranged a little surprise for me. Uh, we do this mission statement thing every week to remind ourselves of who we are and what we're about, and I got here uh, absolutely clueless of Rick and Peggy standing at the door reminding people of you and all your little sideways glances going, uh-huh, yeah, you, going to do it? We're going to do it? No clue. And suddenly I get to this point, world, and suddenly all these people are standing up in front of me shouting with their hands up in the air. And I thought, how did Steve do that? How did Steve get so many people to participate in that? I wondered what was going through your mind. Uh, was it this sense that, hey, everybody's doing, doing it, so I'm going to do it? Or was it just the opportunity to pull one over on Pastor Jim, which I also respect highly? Um, but I thought, okay, this is going to be my sermon illustration. In order for that thing to work, y'all had to do it. At least to my shock and amazement, it looked like everybody was doing it. It had to be at least 75% of you who participated in jumping to your feet and shouting, World! And I want to thank you again for that. That was really a blessing to me. It really warmed my heart. Thank you very much for doing that. But in order for something to work well like that as a group effort, it needs to be a group, a group effort. Uh, Mike, in his prayer, just talked about the importance of team. And as I talk about this theme of the I am needed attitude, I want you to, in the back of your mind, consider this concept of team. The team needs you. And, and for you to carry this I am needed attitude, you need to understand yourself as a part of the team. So I'll begin with this concept, A, believe that you, if you want to fill in the blanks here, I'll give you the blanks, believe that you are needed. In order for your kids to have the I am needed attitude, you need to believe that you are needed. And number one in there is, is to recognize God's design that he created a need for you. He created a need for us. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created. Now, <clears throat> let me ask you this. Does God need you? If you were to let God down or to fail or whatever, would God cease to exist? Is he dependent on you? No, not that way. But let me put the question to you another way. Is God creative? Does he teach in his word that he is creative? Is it therefore by necessity that he creates? Right? Because he's creative. Right? And so it's out of, sort of automatically, naturally flows from his character that he's going to create. He's a creator, so he's going to be creating. It's, sort of, it's not a need, uh, in that he's dependent on it. It's just a natural, necessary function of who he is. Does that make sense? Is God worthy of worship? Certainly. Does it therefore follow that he will necessarily create things to worship him? Not because he needs it, just because it sort of necessarily flows from his character. It's an automatic byproduct of who he is. And so he makes things. He's constantly in the business of creating. We look around us, we see a new season. Creating anew. 
We have Lucy Jean with us and other little voices I hear around the place. God is creating newness all around us all the time. He's also creating us to be worshipers. What is, our, uh, uh, what is the chief end of man, once Mr. Uh, uh, Short Catechism asks? To enjoy God. Uh, the chief end of man, the chief purpose of man is to enjoy God and to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I got that in the wrong order. To glorify God and by doing so to enjoy Him forever. We were made to be worshipers. Does that necessarily follow? You get that? God is creative. He creates. God is worthy of worship. He creates things that worship Him. A natural byproduct, if you will. And this third point, in terms of believing that you are necessary, is one of Steve's favorite points. Pastor Steve often says, if God is sovereign or in control, which we believe him to be, if he is omniscient in knowing all things, then he could have made any version of this world that he wanted to. He could have, if he, if he tried this version, he could have seen how it would turn out and known that that wasn't what he wanted. He could have tried this one and seen how that had turned out, and he knew how that wasn't what he wanted, and he chose this one. Believing that God is sovereign and omniscient, he chose this version of the world that we have before us, and it's the version of the world that has you in it. You could have chosen a version of the world that did not have you in it. Does that stand to reason? But this is the one we got, so this is evidently the one that God chose. So God being a creator, God creating things to worship him, uh, and creating this world that you're in, it seems that indeed, as evidence, that we are needed. Do you believe that? Another piece of the design in God creating, God does not need us, as in he is not dependent upon us, but he created a world that needs us that is dependent upon us doing what we wanted to do or what he made us to do. And this world has a gym-shaped role in it from, say, about 1968 to I don't know when. And it had a, a Gerald Stout-shaped uh, place in it from about 1936 to 2016. For those 80 years, this world was designed for a Gerald Stout-shaped place. And I don't know when your story started, what your birth date was, or when your birth date ends. But this is the world that God has in front of us, the world that he has made, the world that he has filled, you, uh, filled it with you and your time. And so I want to encourage you to believe that indeed you are necessary to it. You are part of the necessary fabric of this world. What's more, in this design, God has not only given us this sense of necessary, ness, but he has instructed us as parents to tell our children. Now, as Steve talked about in the beginning of this series, this parenting by the book is not necessarily for just for parents. Uh, parents uh, have an influence on their children, of course, but co-workers have an influence on their co-workers and neighbors on their neighbors and classmates on their classmates. We have an influence on the people around us. Even if you are not a parent, you have an influence. So kids, this is for you too. You have people that you can influence. But in order to influence those people and give them a sense that they are needed, you need to first believe that you are needed and that there is a design. And part of that design is that we've been commissioned to tell others about it. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up your children in the way that they should go. Parents, tell your children. So that's part of the design, the passing it on, command. But there's also command for you kids. Exodus 20, verse 12 says, honor your father and your mother. So the command is to the children as well that you need to listen to what mom and dad have to say about this design of God and the necessary place for you in, in, in this world. So part of the design is to tell and part of the design is to listen. Do you believe that? In order to believe that you are needed, you need to recognize God's design and how he created a place for you. Secondly, to believe that you are needed, you need to discover, discover your gifts. 
1 Corinthians 12, 7, 11 together say a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. There's a very tailored sort of idea here that each, each one gets one, but it's also tailored to who we are and how we've been made. And in discovering your gift, it adds to your belief that you are indeed needed. I don't know what your gift is. Uh, we have this project we've been working on. We'll pass these out at the congregational meeting. But the geoblocks have together been gathering interest surveys over the course of the past year. Uh, there's uh, your employment skills, the things that Pathway people do for employment, skills they are hireable uh, for, sorted by last name. Uh, there are uh, hireable skills sorted by skills. There are volunteer skills sorted by last name and sorted by skill. There are sports and hobbies. This huge section of the book on sports and hobbies. Uh, sorted by last name, but also then sorted by activity. And then there are some other areas of interest and other categories we didn't know quite where to file them, and we just stuck them on too. So we're going to give this to you, and it represents a host of gifts that God has invested into this place, represented by each one of you. You have a gift. The Spirit has given gifts to us. And I don't know if you know what your gifts are. Um, maybe you do. The older you are, you find the more you tend to use those things. But it's also good to ask the people around you, what am I good at? What do you see me doing well? And parents, of course, this is a great opportunity for us to affirm our children in their gifts. But you need to discover your gifts. And as you discover your gift, you discover that, in fact, then that has a place and a purpose on the team that Mike reminded us about. So discover your gifts. Three, find a significant place to use them. Find a significant place to use them. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now here is what I'm trying to say. All of you together are the one body of Christ, the one team. And each one of you is a separate and necessary part of it. An individually gifted part, but a necessary part to the whole. And as Corinthians lays this out, the purpose of these gifts are for the building up of the body of Christ. And that's represented by us here. We are one particular group of people that God has put together and assembled based on our gifts for His purpose. As Steve and I uh, lead the membership classes, we're continually amazed at the diversity of people that God has brought to us. And just the number. Uh, how many of you were here at Pathway Church before I was? Please raise your hand. I've been here 12 years. Raise your hand if you were here before me. Okay? Now look at around the, around the room and the people not raise their hand. All those people are new. And part of Pathway's mission is continue to reach people and get them connected to a body. So we've, been had the, we've had the opportunity to watch all these people come in and bring their gifts and ability to this place. And we are engaged in a number of things. We bring knitted booties and hats to infants at Metro, thanks to our knitwits. Thank you, knitwits. We make a place for our neighbors to buy and sell produce and crafts out here on the lawn. And we serve them a cup of coffee. A whole host of you are involved in preparing a warm, chilly dinner for freezing cold parade watchers when they come into this place. And then what's more, we give them a gospel-based Christmas concert using our gifts and abilities to do so. Thank you, everybody. We did this fantastic Easter program for our community, for grandmas and grandpas, and for each other. And then the children uh, use their gifts. They did a skit, they did a dance, they sang songs pointing to the resurrection and to Christ who is over all things. We had a sex trafficking awareness night, a mental health uh, awareness night that people from our body arranged for the sake of others. Uh, we, <clears throat> we have men's and women's retreats to engage the new people. Our children, we have leaders who are engaged in 
nursery and little lambs and children's worship, they're, not, they're missing the worship service right now so they can be there with your children to do these things. Nursery, little lambs, children's worship, boys and girls club, flirps and, flirps and youth group. People giving of themselves, some in their giftedness, others just out of necessity. We need some help in some of these areas. Boys club, for instance. Uh, there are people there that are doing their best and would really love to have your help. And so we also have great opportunities to participate if you're not. A little bit about that. Uh, we have this steer into Byron Center thing going on here. The chamber has put that on. Have you seen the cows around town? Some of them are very, very clever. And the, the, <clears throat> the farm market was going to do one. I sit on the farm market committee. And so I, I, I made the suggestion, well, shouldn't we do one? And then I wasn't there when they made it. And so then I was thinking, well, what, what part do I have to play in this steer? Well, in order for the kids' day to have the steer to make... Uh, I had to get it prepped and I had to paint the thing, and I wasn't feeling too involved in it, but then I got the paint, painted the thing, and all of a sudden I care. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I would have done it that way. My critical nature, my artistic nature going, I might have done X, Y, Z. <laughs> but see, I didn't care before I started working on the cow, and then I started working on the cow, and all of a sudden I cared. And if you aren't engaged in stuff here, I want to encourage you to try it. Care. Get involved. There are people that could use your gifts to further our ministry and mission here at Pathway. This is a significant place for you to use your gifts. To, to pass on the I am needed attitude to your children, you have to first of all believe that you are needed. Next, you need to believe that your child is needed. Believe that your child is needed. If you believe that you are a part of God's grand design, that he has created a need, a necessary place for you, that you have gifts that he has given for the employment and service of his kingdom and his church, you need to believe that also about your child. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Before your children were born, God had a task with their name on it. A task with your name on it. Uh, Isaiah is my youngest. We're discovering his gifts and ability. Uh, we're seeing him do things to serve others in the church, serving in his family, serving people around him, holding the door open for complete strangers, and, 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 the, and the, uh, the affirmation he gets from these strangers for doing that. And it's cool to see. And so we're just discovering what the Isaiah-shaped tasks in the world are. But your kids have those too. You have those. There are, shape, there are particularly shaped tasks for you to do and for your children to do. And you need to believe that your children has your child's named task in the world known before they were even born to God, designed by God before they were even born, and believe that they are needed to do them. Next, need your children. If you want your children to have an I am needed attitude, you need to need them, amen? amen. Seems self-evident, uh, but we need to do some things to give them a sense that they are necessary. Number one, we need to train. Train them in necessary tasks. And necessary tasks are age-appropriate. Uh, a one-year-old can't help you mow the lawn, but the one-year-old can help you pick up the toys. And that is a necessary task. And so you train the one-year-old uh, in training up, in, in picking up toys. Um, there's a difference between necessary and unnecessary tasks. This is uh, one of the stories that Steve left for me in his notes. It's called The Hammer Story. When little Johnny was only five years old, uh, he and Daddy built the shed out in the back. He was so proud because Daddy let him hold the hammer and the nails. Daddy and I built the shed, Mommy. He said excitedly to his mom when the job was finished. Ten years later, at the new house, Dad and Big Johnny, now 15, are building another shed. 
Johnny is still needed by dad to hold the hammer and the nails. Mom, do I have to help dad with the shed all day? Asked Johnny discouragingly of his mother at lunchtime. And it's not because 15 year olds are uh, grumpy and not interested in helping. But Johnny recognized that his father's need of him hadn't changed. He was still holding the hammers and the nails like he did when he was five, and that was unnecessary. It was necessary for a five-year-old to hold the hammer and the nails because it was necessary to get the child involved. But as the child grows, the child needs to be added responsibility of now nailing. And that's going to be some bent nails involved and some pulling out nails, and it might take twice as long to do the job, but necessary is to train the child in necessary tasks, not in unnecessary tasks. So age-appropriate, realistic tasks to train them in. And then consistency and discipline. Uh, we talked about uh, infant formula and diapers necessary for the, for the orphanage. I have a, a story about my infant uh, Ezra, and uh, he's not here this morning. My infant Ezra was a puker. And uh, we'd put food in him, he'd gurgle it around in there a little bit, and then he'd usually shoot it at you somehow, or all over himself. My wife was consistent in the discipline of changing the child's clothes uh, in the morning. It was morning. And so set the child on the changing table, take off the nighttime clothes, put on the daytime clothes. And I said to my wife, why are you doing that? He hasn't puked on them yet. <laughs> a little later, put a little food in them. Sure enough, <laughs> there it comes, all over the daytime clothes. So back on the changing table, off with those clothes, on with clean clothes. And every morning, she would put on the daytime clothes, take off the nighttime clothes, and put on the daytime clothes. And then the puke would follow. And I thought, why? why? I don't understand this. It seems backwards to me. Until that day where mom wasn't there, and I had to get the infant child ready. And I had to get to my meeting and get that child to grandma's in order to make my meeting. So I grabbed the child, put him on the table, take off the nighttime clothes, and I hold down, I put them on the daytime clothes, and I hold out the sleeve, and the kid goes, so I hold up the other sleeve, and the kid goes, I hold up the pants, and the kid goes, I hold up the other leg, and he does the same thing, and I said, oh, the wisdom of my wife, brilliant to train this child in daytime activity. The kid doesn't know he needs clothing. Mom knew that there would come a time when getting the child changed would be expedited by training and consistency. And I realized my wife was brilliant. She is, John. <clears throat> consistency and discipline. Moreover, uh, when we train our children, we want to deal with the awkwardness now. Vomit is easier in smaller portions. It is. But when we want to talk about sex ed, rite of passage, dating and abstinence, those are going to be awkward conversations. Count on it. Amen? Do it when they're younger. Begin that talk early. Get over the awkwardness when the awkwardness is less. Engage the process of awkwardness to prevent pain later. The earlier you start with changing your children's clothes in the morning, the easier it will be to get them to do that when it's necessary. The, e the earlier you begin to get your children in routines that are necessary, the easier it will be to continue those. The, the earlier you make a plan to go to church every single Sunday and not miss, the less the arguments when they're 15 because this is just what we do. 
and we've already demonstrated it, that this is valuable to us as a family. Awkwardness now versus pain later. Train them in necessary tasks. And finally, uh, this idea that I hear some parents say out in the world, well, I, you know, I don't know about religion. I just wanted to let my child decide. That is contrary to Proverbs 22.6 that says, train up your children in the way that they should go. There is God's way or the world's way. You train them in God's way or you leave them to the world. And this is a devilish option, letting your children decide when they're wee little. Of course they have to decide. That's what profession of faith is all about. But you train them in the way that they should go. There was a... uh, conference when I was working at the Bible League at the Drake Hotel in Chicago, $2,500 a ticket. It was, it was attended by these big multi-million dollar companies, Pepsi, Coke, Pizza Hut, I don't remember them all. But I couldn't afford a ticket there, but I got the copy of the notes. <laughs> and the notes were all focused on marketing to teens and tweens, which are the 8 to 12 year olds. And one of the things, a, a, a number of things got my attention, focusing on how much discretionary uh, 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 money uh, these kids had access to how many of them actually had credit cards available to them. And this whole industry was figuring out how to maximize their earnings off of the teens and tweens. And one of the things I saw repeatedly in the notes and the paradigm that they were uh, sharing with one another is we need to wean these tweens off of their parents' values and get them to value us and our brand. So if we neglect to train up our children in the way that they should go, the world will gladly do it for us and all their discretionary income. Do not let them decide when they're little. Train them in the routine that is valuable to you. Talking and listening to God, meeting with God's people for worship, do things God's way as he has instructed. To tell them that they are valuable, necessary parts of his plan that they're created to worship him, and God chose this world with them in it. So number one is train. Number two is give. Give them necessary tasks. Not just train them in the necessary tasks, but like Johnny with the hammer, give them necessary tasks. And there's a different difference here between needs and wants. We talked about this with the youth group a little while ago where we were talking about prayer. Uh, We talked about the difference between needs and wants, and kids understand that sports is a want, eating is a need. But you can use those to your advantage. You want to play sports? Good. Help us make dinner. Clear the table. Figure out, help your kids figure out wants and needs and help them to focus on need. You want them to have an I am needed attitude, engage them in necessary tasks. Employ them. Use them. What needs to be done? Consider the needs of your home. Now, it's, it's true that if your kids don't do these things, no one's going to die. But as a parent, if your kids aren't helping you with the needs around your home, you might go out of your ever-loving mind, trying to do it all, get them everywhere, and try to do all the things. There are four basic needs that we can do in our homes and employ our kids in the use of, or in, in, the, in the action of doing these things. Now, Now, back in the day, when we were on the farm, look, as many kids as you could have, the better, right? I'm one of four. Well, I didn't live on a farm. My mom is one of four. She didn't live on a farm. Her mom, my grandmother, is one of six. She lived on a farm. Her mom, Agnes, is one of 12. Yeah, she lived on a farm. And I think her husband was one of nine or ten. They all lived on the farm. There was so much need on the farm, you kept making children to help you with the need. Your household still has basic needs that these kids need to do, that need to be done, whether you have your kids do them or not. Four things, they start with L. Say lunch. 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 Your kids, everybody in your house needs to eat, right? Your kids can be engaged in making food. Needs and wants. Maybe they don't want to make food. Okay. Pretty soon they will find out needs are important, more important than wants. Don't want to make food? 
Okay? You don't have to eat the food. We want the food. We will make the food. You don't want to make the food. You don't have to eat the food. Pretty soon they will find out that needs are greater than wants. Engage them in lunch. Number two, say lawn. Lawn. You have an exterior of your property that needs to be maintained. Your children can learn the skills of maintaining these things. I have four, I have a, I have a herd of four lawnmowers. They're not goats, they're lawnmowers. Uh, they, they are learning to handle potentially deadly machinery at an age-appropriate time. But they understand it's necessary to the running of our household. And it's a privilege and responsibility. How many of you kids are looking forward to driving at age 16? Right? Weren't you? It's a privilege and responsibility. As parents, we're like, huh, it's a task. I drive my kids everywhere. But your kids are looking forward to this privilege and responsibility. And if you do it right, kids will look forward to the privilege and responsibility of mowing the lawn. Someday you're big. You'll be big like your brother. You'll be able to mow the lawn too. Champ. But give them a sense of necessary things that need to be done. Lunch, lawn, say laundry. 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 Because they eat lunch and they work outside, you're going to have to do laundry. The clothes get dirty. Now, again, leverage needs and wants. Children want to wear this brand. Oh, that's fantastic. You wash your clothes, you can, we'll help you get that brand. Or the money that you earn from lunch and laundry and lawn will help you buy the brand you want. Lunch, lawn, laundry, and say, limpia la casa. Limpia la casa. I don't know if that's right, but that's what Google told me. Cleaning the house. Limpia la casa. Cleaning the house. It needs to be done. All of these things are tasks, necessary tasks for your household to operate. Engage your children in these necessary tasks, and they will... It will demonstrate your need for them and help them develop the I am needed attitude. Number three, affirm. Affirm their accomplishments. That is great. That is fantastic. You know, that really helps us out a ton. Since you got that done, I think we'll be able to go to ice cream tonight. Sound good? Yeah. We needed that done. Thank you for doing that. It was very kind of you to think of that. It was very kind of you to hold the door open for that lady, Isaiah. Thank you. I don't know. When I was your age, I don't know if I could have done that. Can you show me how this smartphone works? <laughs> Need your children and affirm them for the necessary things that they do. Number four, <clears throat> help them discover their gifts. Help them discover their gifts. And I have a list of things there that help us discover their gifts that I think are in priority order. School. Uh, in school, your children will develop their minds and their abilities, and they will also use, as parents, use this to watch for their gifts. What areas do they excel in? Say, hey, you're really good with those numbers. Maybe you want to be a mechanic or an, or a, an architect or a, an engineer or an accountant. Or maybe you're really good with working with those tools. Maybe you want to be a mechanic. <clears throat> it, in, in school, develops the basic language, communication, uh, uh, there's so much potential that we have in our minds that if it is trained, can do remarkable things. So school is a priority in helping your children discover their gifts. But do not let schools succumb to an upside-down list here. Kids have wants. They have sports and hobbies. But that needs to be at the bottom of the list. School is at the top. Next thing is employment and service. We're using God has given us gifts to be employed in the service of other people. All of you who have an income are doing that primarily for somebody else. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And, the, and that work is typically not just for you. Not many of you are employed in the, own, in the building of your own car, the building of your own house, the, the sewing of your own clothing, most of us are employed in those services for others. And whether it's a, a paid thing or a volunteer thing, 
this is what we're made for. It's that, again, can return to this underlying Christian principle that we are not here for us. Like Jesus who came for others, we are here for others. And six days we do work primarily for other people. And it's because I can't do everything that I need for me. I need all of you in my community to do the services that I need to stay alive. I need someone to grow my food. I need someone to fix my car. I need someone to make sure the roof on my head, over my head doesn't leak. And so I'm employed in services that help other people so that I can pay people to fix those things that I can't. We are in a, a network of people that need each other. And our, our, our schooling and our discovering of our gifts is principally in the employment and service of other people. Teach your children to be employable. Those of you who have a job know what it looks like when you have to go to employ people, what's valuable to your team and what's not. A self-focused person is not going to be very valuable to your team. Don't let your children be self-focused. Teach them in a Christian way that is others-focused, and they will be valuable to their employer. It's very practical. And then finally, Sabbath. We have a whole booklet here of, of inventory of, of our interests and uh, likes and uh, hobbies and sports. This is a great way for us to connect to people. Next week is a Pathway Church University Sunday. Uh, we're going to offer classes. And I, I don't know if you have any in mind yet, but right here you can look and see who might be interested in taking your class. You can find out who is also interested in gardening or cooking or crafts or music. There's a whole inventory of these things. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, and the seventh is the Sabbath. It's a day of rest. It's a day of enjoyment. To discover new things outside of your work and service for others. Things where you engage God's creation and enjoy it. And that doesn't mean you have to limit it just to one day, but probably a, a six-sevenths to one-seventh ratio of how you use your time for yourself. Every day, principally focused on employment for the service of others, and then another portion of it for the things that I'm interested in, or helping my family discover their gifts and all these other things that we're just talking about now, of developing the I am needed attitude. So, number four, help them discover their gifts, use this as a helpful priority set. And number five, you want your kids to develop an I am needed attitude, you want them to feel needed, you want to actually need them, help them see needs. Help them see needs without being asked. Isn't it a blessing, parents, when kids come to you and say, I took care of this. I didn't even ask you. Yeah, but I knew it needed to be done. Isn't it awesome when your kids take care of things and you didn't even ask them to do it, but they saw that it needed to be done, so they did? If you want to develop kids that have a sense of being needed, help them see a bigger picture. Develop, help them develop a grand vision for where they fit in the world. There were some people that I talked to, some passages that came to mind that uh, I just want to share with you about that I think if we can pass on these kind of things, these big picture kind of things to our kids, that they will develop an I am needed attitude. Uh, I mentioned Esther and Heather. Esther for the passage and Heather for my friend. Uh, Heather serves on the uh, community wellness committee with me uh, at the farmer's market, and yesterday she was uh, telling us about what happened to her daughters. Uh, she lives over here, uh, just off of, just west of Byron Center Avenue, right there, um, around the corner by the dentist's office with a sign, you know, where it's got the uh, date and time and temperature. Uh, she just lives around the corner there, and her daughter was waiting to turn around that corner, waiting for traffic to clear. And uh, as she looked in her rear view mirror, there's a car coming at her, not slowing down, and she noticed the driver was looking down at her phone. And so she, she instinctively tried to turn and get out of the way, but she was struck from behind, turned into oncoming traffic, and sideswiped um, this vehicle uh, driven by the wife of the insurance guy down there, ironically. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and her car was totaled. But, but she was fine. Both of her daughters were in the car. Both of her daughters were fine. But they were traumatized, having just been in this wreck. And what they talked about was all the heavy construction traffic that has been coming down that road lately and how different. How 
how differently that could have turned out. We've all been in close calls. We've all known trauma of various kinds. <clears throat> Things could change in a moment. But it's also a good time to assess your time. And I talked to her about Esther. I said this verse. This is Esther was going before the king. Uh, her uncle had said to her that her people are about to be slaughtered. Her uncle said to her, uh, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will, arrive, or will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. She was hesitant to go before the king unasked for because if you went into the king's presence and he didn't like that you came in without being asked to do so, he would kill you. And so she knew what was at risk here. But her uncle is saying to her, look, I, either you're going to be killed by the king for coming into his presence or you're going to be killed because you're a Jew. And then he said this, and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. It was Esther's time. It was the trauma of the situation that moved Esther to, in fact, go before the king and plead for her people's cause. And Heather and I talked about her daughter. And she said her daughter uh, is interested in uh, special ed, and she's taking special education classes and lining up to do that. And, and I said to her, well, evidently God has in mind for her, your daughter con to continue on that course because she's still here. She said, yeah, that's what we've been talking about for the past 24 hours. Trauma is a good time to assess your place in the world in, as part of God's big picture. This next passage also came to mind. It's about reflecting. Uh, Pastor Steve often quotes this verse. It's one of his favorites. Uh, we in America have our George Washingtons and our Abraham Lincolns. Israel had King David. And this is what Paul said about King David. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, he was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. It's a real pick-me-up, huh? Kind of morbid. But once you get past the morbidity of this text, you realize that that's the principal purpose of our lives is to serve God's purpose in our time. There is no greater purpose for us than to serve God's purpose in our time. David, the great king of Israel, did what was great. He served God's purpose in his time. And when he was done, he died and became part of the worm food. But he had served God's purpose. That was the most noble thing anyone can do. But you, you, this makes sense to you at times of reflection. When you pause, maybe after trauma, maybe 24 hours after the trauma has passed and you're looking back on the occasion. And so what does God want me to learn from this? God does not waste pain. Reflection is an important part of teaching your kids that they are needed and getting them a sense of seeing needs without being asked because they realize their place in the world. We're going to sing this song, this next one, in a moment. Paul says in the context of community. Community is another way, another big picture way in which we see how we fit. Uh, this is our song that we sing uh, from Romans 12, 4, and 5. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are all parts of his one body, and each of us has a different work to do. And since we are all one body in Christ, we belong each other. And each of us needs all the others. It's in the context of community, we say in our membership class, in which we discover our gifts, in which we discover a significant place for our gifts to be used. It's where our kids can plug in. Our kids uh, who did this skit the other day for Easter, uh, or came up here and did the song with the sticks, or they, they sang to us, they contributed to our, uh, our worship that morning creating a need, a necessary place for them because they're part of this body. But also helping them do that, serving as a youth leader or a children's worship uh, person. Uh, there are things that we do around this church uh, as part of this community. Uh, we have a spring and a fall cleanup and we painted the building. These things we did in the past year. We don't, I'm not asking you to come and do this because you don't have your own house to clean up, but because this is our house our house to present to our community. I'm not asking you to come to the potluck when you're, because you don't have a kid in the race. 
Some of you are like, well, you know, I don't have any kids in there. I don't have any kids in the youth group fundraiser. I don't have any kids in the Boys and Girls Club derby race. So you don't think you need to come. Well, these are our kids. These are our kids that are going to Guatemala. This is our team. They need your support. Being a part of community gives us a sense that we are indeed necessary. And the more we participate, the greater the impact. The more of you who stand up and shout, world, the greater the impact on your surprise pastor. And then there's Jack. How many of you know Jack Palmboss? He's the owner of the family restaurant over here. Been pouring your coffee for 30 years, giving you a place to meet with friends. Giving you a place to make plans and dates and business deals and weddings and, and all kinds of things that happen there over food. He's been pouring our coffee for 30 years. But Jack's also been a volunteer fireman. Showing up when your house is on fire or when your, car's, your daughter's car gets totaled on Byron Center Avenue. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the Chamber of Commerce honored Jack Palmboss with a Circle of Honor Award. And at that dinner, he shared from memory this poem. And it, it reflects Jack's orientation to the world and why he is the kind of guy that he is. From memory, he, say, he said this poem uh, called, Are You Building Up or Tearing Down? He said, I saw them tearing a building down, a gang of men in a dusty old town. With a ho-heave-ho and a lusty yell, they swung a beam and the side wall fell. So I asked the foreman if his men were as skilled as the men he'd hire if he were to build. He laughed and he said, oh no indeed, common laborers are all I need. So I asked myself as I went my way, what kind of role am I to play? Am I a builder who builds with care, measuring life by the rule and square? Or am I a wrecker who walks the town, content with the role of tearing down? Now Jack's not a perfect guy. But his orientation is to building up. And it's demonstrated in the life he leads, in the community he serves. Then there's Bob. I want to give you Bob as an example of giving all. Two weeks ago, I was at my home church, Emmanuel, and I shared this memory with the people there. And I asked them if they knew this guy's name, because I didn't. I was eight or nine years old when this life-changing event happened for me. For special music... This guy was announced, and this guy gets up, he's got sunglasses on and a long white cane. He's got this little lady, his little wife, helping him up, and as a kid, I'm fascinated watching this guy navigate down the middle aisle of my church. He gets to the steps, he goes up those steps, gets up to the podium, and then there's a keyboard there. I think, what's a blind guy going to do with a keyboard? His wife brought him over there, helped him get oriented to where the keys were. He started to play. I didn't know who Stevie Wonder was at this time. I couldn't believe that a blind guy could play a keyboard. And I was just amazed. So I'm watching. He begins to sing. Oh, Lord, my God, when I, an awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. The blind guy says, I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul. And that's when Bob cut loose. All the time I'd been mesmerized by the blind guy playing the keyboard. I didn't realize how loud he was getting. And pretty soon he was lifting the roof off of that place with the biggest voice I'd ever heard in my life. And I didn't know what it meant to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Moment changed my life. I want to be like that guy. And I don't know if you've ever sat in front of me while I'm singing. I apologize, but not really. It's Bob's fault. I want to sing with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength because Bob, that's what Bob did. Left it all on the field, coach. He gave it all. He couldn't work anymore. 
His macular degeneration started uh, uh, while he was still working, and eventually he had to quit his job at Steelcase because he was in quality control and he couldn't see. <clears throat> He'd been in a bar band. He'd been a musician, I understand now. I found out more details. But he'd been converted later in life, and uh, <clears throat> although he couldn't see, he continued to play and develop his musical abilities and his desire to, desire to praise the Lord. Uh, and, and Bob changed my life. And I'm thankful to Bob. I think he's been gone for five years now, I just found out. Someday I'll say thanks. Another way, the final way I have here for finding out or, or teaching your kids to have an I am needed attitude, helping them to see needs without being asked, is to develop a sense of empathy. Trying to get into somebody else's shoes and feel what they're feeling. We know Scott and Mary, we love them dearly. They've ministered to us, they've blessed us. Right now, Mary is resting. Mary is a mom who's been cut off from her kids and grandkids and had recently opportunity to reconnect with them and doing everything in her power to help her child and her grandchildren and was not sleeping and, and continued to think, how can I help, how can I help, how can I help until uh, she herself needed help. We love Scott and Mary, and I don't know if Scott and Mary even know what to ask for. Well, we've been there. We've been traumatized. I don't think it matters. Reach out and help. Empathy is just to, dis just to show love in whatever way you can possibly think of. Some of you have made cards. How many of you kids know that, uh, that Grandpa Scott and Mar uh, Grandma Mary love you? They do all kinds of stuff for us. Just love them back right now. Figure out a way. Have empathy for people who are suffering around you. Help your children feel needed, because in fact they are. And then finally, model. Model these things for yourself. God calls, commands our, our children to uh, honor their father and mother. Well, we need to be honorable as well. We need to do these things. We need to give our kids necessary tasks, teach them responsibility, train them up in the way that they should go. It's an honorable thing to do. When we're looking out for our kids and engaging them, they will honor us. They will respect our efforts, even if, we, even if we're not perfect in doing so. Also, develop maturity. Pastor Steve last week talked about dependence, independence, and interdependence. I think there's a progression of those things as we mature. When we start out, we need someone to change our clothing and feed us. And as we grow uh, into adolescence, we become pretty proud that we can tie our own shoes or dress ourselves or feed ourselves. <clears throat> But moving on past adolescence and this independence is this place of interdependence, realizing that I need you and you need me. And that's where maturity comes in, realizing that I don't have all the gifts necessary to get by in this world, and I need you, and I have things I can offer you. And so we move to interdependence, the importance of relationships and networking, etc. Because those of us who are wise know that we're going to be moving on to dependence and someone might have to change our clothes again later. So you want to build a good relationship with those people who can change your clothes. But maturity is about interdependence. And then finally, what if? What if we modeled to the world around us an all-in attitude that we are indeed needed? There is a principle in business called the 80-20 principle or the 20-80 principle that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Have you heard this? It's, it's very, very helpful for figuring out your sales and managing your people and all those kind of things. <clears throat> but as long as I've been here, Pastor Steve has been about boosting that number. Not about 20% of us doing 80% of the work. Pastor Steve's orientation is to helping all of us read daily. All of us praying daily. What would it look like if 30% if of Pathway was doing 70% of the work? I bet it's more than that. When I look at all the things we're doing in the no, in fairly small number of us who are here, in the ways we're engaged, I think it's more than that. But what would it look like if we had 40% of the people doing 60% of the work, or 50% of the people doing 50% of the work, or 70% of the people doing 30% of the work, or will heaven be 100% of the people doing 100% of the work? 
Maybe that's what heaven will look like. Everybody employing their gifts to the fullest possible measure. How close can we get to that now? What would it look like at our camp out if every single one of us came? What kind of encouragement that would that be for the body? Or our next potluck. If 100% of the people brought not a bag of chips, but a tremendous salad that everybody loved. And they came because it was part of the team. What would it look like if every single one of us showed up to a softball game next week? The other team would be floored. What? Who are these people? We walk onto the field and everybody in the stands goes, World! (laughs) Model these things yourself. Finally, kids, if you are a kid and you are still in here, if you are a high school kid, or younger, please stand. High school kids or younger, please stand. That's right. I have a message for you. First Timothy 4.12 Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. You people that are standing, we need you. You come on the stage, you sing your songs, you do your dance, you do your skit, we need you. You have no idea how inspiring it is for us old people when you do your stuff. Can I get an amen from the old people? When we send you off to Guatemala, you're willing to discover other cultures, more about yourself and how you can serve. And younger people need you. There's a whole bunch of kids that aren't in here right now. They're over in nursery, little lambs, and children's worship. And they think you are the coolest thing in the world. And you are. Because if you spend your life loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will have a powerful impact on those kids, probably more powerful than us, your parents. But if you know your place, if you know your gifts, and you exercise them, you will have a tremendous influence on us old people and on those young people that are watching you. Because the young people that are standing here, the shorter ones among you right now, I know you're looking up to these older ones that are among you too, taller ones. And you taller ones, you've got this huge responsibility and privilege to model what needed looks like. Thank you. You may be seated. Father God, thank you for making us a necessary part of your plan. Each one of us, gifts and abilities that you've invested in us. To love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Ways in which we can influence this group of people. And the group of people outside that are watching Pathway to see what Pathway does. How we care for our own. How we love the Lord how we show hospitality, how we make the visitor feel welcome, how we make the new people feel engaged, not just friendly, but engaged and enfolded. People are watching, Lord, and we want you to be glorified. Lord, help us to discover our gifts, to employ our gifts, so that you will be glorified. Father, we ask you to move in our midst, make us more and more like you, so that you can be more and more glorified. You have made it so that we are needed. We need you and we need each other. In Jesus' name, everybody say, amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to be taking an offering uh, for the work of our church and for uh, the second offering for uh, uh, diapers and uh, formula to go to Guatemala with our team. If you're new visiting with us, there's a thing in the program where you can fill out and tell us how it is that you got to be here this morning. Thanks. All right, and let's sing our closing song as we're taking the offerings. And you're welcome to stand. You're probably ready. Has different 
with work to do. Since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the other. Sorry for being so emotional this week. It's been a rough one. But God needs us. And I've been acutely aware of my need. And as I read this blessing to you, I'm noting the last phrase. This first part is familiar. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you Mm -hmm. and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. And so the, the priests will put my name on the Israelites. And I will bless them because the name of the Lord... On them. Amen. Join us for uh, coffee and uh, cookies. Uh, grab that. Greet our guests. If you need prayer, please come to the front and uh, return here in a moment for our congregational meeting. Thanks. <laughs> I, I think my cup is going off. 